Did you see that movie? Okay. It actually is pretty good Roman history. It's, it's, a, it's a movie, and there are some people in the movie who are alive, who are not alive at the same time. It's not very reliable in that way. But as social history, it's actually reasonably good. And there's a scene when the, the general, Maximus, is in front of a fireplace, and he has little, they look like toy figures, like little dolls made of clay. He puts them out there. Those in the Roman religion were called lares or manes. They represented the souls of your ancestors. Because much like uh, some uh, forms of Asian ancestor worship, the Romans had a religion very much oriented towards the worship of ancestors. <clears throat> and you always kept the fire burning. The fire in the hearth must always be burning because it represented the souls of your ancestors. And they were in the soil. So for instance, in the Aeneas, the famous poem of Virgil about Rome, the founding of Rome, the story was, it's probably not true, but this is what the Romans believed, was that Rome was founded by the Trojans. You know in Western uh, 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 Greek history, the war between the Greeks and the Trojans, the belief of the Romans was that the Tro Trojans escaped, led by this young man Aeneas, came to Rome and founded Rome. It's probably not true, but it was their founding story. And he brought from him, from Troy, the fire from the sacred fireplace of the family of Priam, king of Troy. So he put in a stick and he lit it on fire. They took it to the ship, always kept the fire going, the same fire. And they took soil, dirt, to represent the ancestors with them. Then when they went to Rome, they took the sacred oxen, they plowed a big circle, and they threw the dirt into it, transferring the souls of their ancestors to this soil and the fire was used to, to burn the, the holy fire. If you have that view of land, you can't sell it because your ancestors are in it. Right? Well, the consequence of that is it's very difficult to develop a complex market economy if land cannot be bought and sold because your ancestors are in it. It would be a, a crime, a sin against your family gods, as in the case of the, the soldier Maximus with those little things, the little dolls, they represent the ancestors and he was asking them to help him in his struggle. <clears throat> so the Roman lawyers invented a brilliant technique. It's called the re vindicatio in Roman law. It's an act of vindication. Oops, sorry, there we go. You are filming, okay. It is an act of vindication in which the uh, owner of a piece of land who wants to sell it to another person who has a better idea of how to use it. Let's say I have land and I'm a very bad farmer. So my productivity on the land is very low. But Ling is a great farmer. He really knows how to farm the land. He could grow a lot more food on the land than I can. A more efficient system would be for me to transfer it to him he would grow more food than I can because I'm not a very good farmer. But if the land is sacred, I can't sell it. So what the Roman lawyers said was as follows. They said, Tom, you and Ling have a conversation. Have a fight. Ling invades your land, throws you out. Then you say, oh, I have been expelled from my ancestral land. I go to the courts. I say, I want justice. And the courts say, Ling is a very tough character. We can't throw him out. So instead, Ling will have to compensate you by paying you money for invading your land. Now, interestingly enough, the amount of compensation was what Ling and I agreed on at the beginning. So it was a legal fiction that allowed them to go around this uh, sacred character of land so land could become something that could be transferred in the market to people who valued it more. In this case, Ling can grow 10 times as much food as I can. So it is in our mutual interest for him to give me more than I can grow from it, but less than he can grow. And both of us will benefit from that exchange and the resources shifted to a more highly productive use. So the 
property rights in a market need to be definable, defendable, so you need a system of rule of law for both, to define rights, to defend rights, and also a system of law to allow people to transfer them. That is what contract is for. We make a contract to sale for whatever goods may be at stake. Now property rights are not merely about me asserting my interest. This is how they're often interpreted. People say, oh, you want property just because you're selfish. Property requires us to be responsible. It requires us to take into account the interests and the rights of other people. Because in a market system, you have what is called several property. This is the term John Locke and others used. It means everybody has access to the opportunity to have property, not just the king or the cronies or the prime minister or his friends, but everybody is a participant in the market system. <coughs> and what it means is, as in the case of Fazrul's objects here, I have to take his rights into account when I act. I could not harm him without compensating him because he has rights. So for example, when we have well-defined rights, like normally rights in land in, in developed countries are well-defined. In poor countries, rights to land are typically very badly defined. No one knows exactly who owns what. That's the difference between Mexico and the United States and Canada, for example. In the US and Canada, you know exactly what is yours and what is your neighbor's. In Mexico you don't and consequently villages will actually go to war with each other over water rights, over land rights, grazing rights, and so on. But in places where rights are well defined, you have to take into account the interests and the rights of others. Land, good example. It is very rare for someone to take garbage and just put it into your front yard or walk into your house and just put garbage all over. Why? The rights are well defined to your house and they're defendable. But take cases where rights are not well defined and not defendable, like waterways or the air. People throw garbage in them. We call it pollution because the rights are not well defined and they're not defendable as a consequence. So when you have rights that are not well defined, and not defendable, expect people to put trash and garbage there. Pollution and other kinds of what are called negative externalities. Harms that are put upon other people. <clears throat> so if we harm others, we have to compensate them. I have to bear the cost of the harm I do to you. If in fact I'm driving my car or my truck full of trash and it, I have an accident and it puts trash in your front yard or in your house, I have to come clean it out. I have to compensate you. I have to pay to clean your house and wash all of your things and give you money for the suffering that you experienced. But typically in waterways where there's no private property rights, no one is compensated. The people put the garbage into the water because there's no one who has a right to stop them. In contrast, in countries where water is privately owned, like Scotland, if you put trash in a Scottish stream or river, a man wearing a dress is going to come out, a kilt, he says, hold on man, stop it right now. <laughs> you cannot put that trash in my river. Right? Why? Because it's his. He owns it. And in particular, they usually own the fishing rights in it. You put in garbage into the water, the fish die, there's fewer fish to catch, he can't sell fishing rights, to rich English people who come to fish, he <laughs> suffers a loss. He's right there saying, you can't do that. And if you do it, you have to compensate him and make him complete, whole, as he was before. <coughs> but in addition, there's another way that we take the interest of others into account. I'll give you a very simple example. I have an apartment in Washington, D.C., a condominium. I'm not a really rich person, but I have a nice uh, apartment in it. I recently installed a second bathroom. Now there's only one of me. I can't use two bathrooms at the same time. It's an unpleasant thought anyway. So I, it's just why would I do that? Well in my neighborhood there's a big demand for two, two bedroom apartments with two bathrooms. If I install a second bathroom